Today, we cover some of the most brutal and savage bear attack stories we've covered on this channel all year. From man-eating black bears, murderous grizzlies, and even bloodthirsty polar bears, this video is sure to make you think twice about going into the woods ever again. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. These are the deadliest bear attacks of 2023. Welcome to Final Affliction. With the exception of his dog, Daniel worked alone. The rough, rugged terrain of the Alaskan mountains were his perfect office. He used his cabin in Turnigan as a base and set off on foot from it each day to work on the trail. The cabin was a couple of miles from a paved road that connected the community of Hope to the Seward Highway. The picturesque spot was about 25 miles southeast of Anchorage. On July 29, 2020, Daniel awoke early. He looked out through his cabin's window. He could see that he was blessed with clear blue skies for the day. He dressed in his gear, putting on his sturdy boots and clipping his bear spray canister onto his belt. It is believed he also placed his handgun in his backpack. During his construction work, he preferred to keep bear spray on him rather than a firearm. A shotgun or rifle weighed him down and got in the way. Daniel didn't plan on being out for long and decided he would return to the cabin for lunch later in the day. He picked up his water bottle and after a quick breakfast, he whistled to his dog and stepped outside. The two of them set off towards the path he was constructing. It was less than a mile from the cabin. Sawing down saplings and lopping off branches, Daniel gradually inched along the route he was carving through the great Alaskan wilderness. His dog carelessly sniffed around the surrounding trees and wandered through the clearing as Daniel worked. As midday loomed, the dense foliage sheltered Daniel from the growing heat of the rising sun. It was tiring work and he paused for a breather, wiping the sweat from his brow and taking a sip from his water bottle. When suddenly, a brown bear came crashing through the undergrowth. Daniel barely had time to react. He fumbled for the bear spray, pointing it directly at the charging grizzly. He emptied the entire contents of the canister before the bear flattened him to the floor. Daniel struggled to breathe. The full force of the bear had knocked the wind from his lungs and now it stood pushing down on him. Its giant paws pressed firmly on his chest. Daniel kicked and thrashed about, trying desperately to hit the bear. He smacked the bear again and again on the snout, but this only enraged the bear more. It let out a deep guttural growl and opened its jaws. Daniel could see saliva dripping from its jowls as it lowered its head menacingly. Ferociously, it bit into Daniel's face. He let out a yell as a tooth hit bone. Again, the bear bit down and scraped its claws over Daniel's chest. The attack that ensued was likely brutal and ferocious, but no one knows quite what happened to Daniel. His tragic death was both a shock to those who knew him and a mystery to others. His dog found its way home, and when Daniel's wife saw the dog arrive home without Daniel, she hurriedly called his friends. None of them had seen him. Working within such dense vegetation, it is likely that Daniel didn't see the bear until it was right upon him. If he did have his handgun in his backpack like his friend said he did, then there definitely wouldn't have been enough time to use it. Maybe it was his dog that alerted him to the bear, maybe Daniel had time to retreat a little, maybe the dog provoked the attack, no one quite knows. After Daniel's wife called his friends raising the alarm, they went to check on him. They assumed that he may have fallen and sprained an ankle or broken a leg. Walking past his cabin, they followed the path that Daniel had carved through the undergrowth. Little more than a mile along the path, his friends stopped in their tracks. They had found Daniel's body on the ground, bloodied and lifeless. His injuries were consistent with a brown bear attack. In those desperately sad and heart-stopping moments, they called the local police department to report the terrible news. Daniel's wife and friends were in utter disbelief that he was gone. He was such an experienced outdoorsman. They knew his knowledge and hunting expertise had served him well throughout the years, but now their worlds came crashing down. State wildlife biologists arrived on the scene. The stench of pepper spray was still in the air. The empty canister was found about 15 feet from Daniel's body. A thorough scout of the area found nothing that would have attracted a bear, such as a moose carcass or other food sources. Daniel had been working relatively close to Six Mile Creek, a salmon spawning stream but officials didn't consider it close enough to the attack site for Daniel to be considered prey. The puzzling evidence found by field experts was that both black bear and brown bear DNA were found on Daniel's body. It is usual for these bears to tolerate each other and often black bears give the larger grizzlies a wide berth. 
However, with evidence of both bears present at the attack site, some locals considered them to have attacked Daniel together, a form of teamwork amongst bears. This, however, is highly unlikely. Bears are largely solitary animals. They do not hunt in pairs or groups, and subspecies never socially mix with one another. In fact, brown bears have been known to kill black bears. So what exactly did happen to Daniel? The most likely explanation is that he unknowingly disturbed a large female brown bear, which attacked him. She wasn't necessarily preying on him, but had been startled and had felt threatened. She was eliminating this threat from her territory by attacking the intruder. Uninterested in eating him, she left the kill site. If bears cannot eat their prey then and there, they often cover it up, hiding it from other predators and scavengers in order to return to it later. There was no evidence of Daniel's body being partially buried or hidden with dirt or foliage. Bear spray may sting the eyes and nose when in direct contact, but it can also attract bears. In this case, a black bear was probably attracted either by the smell of the spray or by the fresh kill and made its way to Daniel's body. This would explain the presence of both bear subspecies at the site. But why was the bear spray ineffective during the initial attack? The Regional Wildlife Supervisor for the Alaskan Department of Fish and Game, who was tasked with investigating Daniel's death, suspected the bear spray was faulty. The spray is sold by Costco stores in Anchorage and is manufactured by a company called UDAP. There had been concerns that some cans manufactured between March and August of that year could have been defective. There is also strong criticism over the effectiveness of bear spray, particularly regarding wind direction, which could result in the spray being blown away from the target. A flyby of the area where Daniel had been killed the following day found two black bears and one brown bear within several miles of Daniel's location. It's probable that many other bears were also in close proximity, but these were not spotted by officials. The DNA evidence collected from swabs of Daniel's body and clothing pointed towards two female bears. A week after the attack, wildlife biologists shot and killed three female black bears and one female grizzly. DNA from one of the black bears matched that found at the kill site. DNA from that brown bear did not. Following a bear attack, there is always some debate about the use of pepper spray. Some swear by it, others say it is foolish to go into bear territory without a high caliber firearm. Although rangers and wildlife experts always recommend the use of bear spray over a firearm, research has shown that bear spray can actually be an attractant for some bears. Scientists studying bears in Alaska's Katmai National Park in the 1990s found that the majority of the bears they observed actually rolled and wriggled around in spray the researchers had sprayed onto the ground. They were vigorously scent rubbing their entire bodies in the spray residue. Sprayed directly from a can, however, results in the stinging of the eyes and nose and this is thought to deter an approaching bear. The cause of Daniel's attack remains a mystery. It is still not known whether the attack was defensive or predatory. What has been determined, however, is that he was killed by a female brown bear who are notorious for mauling anyone who stands between her and her cubs, often leading to the unfortunate victim's final affliction. With its rich agricultural history, the city of Chateau in Montana evokes striking images of a green landscape with a variety of wildlife. It is home to some of the world's most elegant species in the animal kingdom. Mule deers, wolves, badgers, squirrels, moose, elks, and bears, both black and grizzly, all coexist in this biota. This automatically makes Choteau a great venery ground for game hunting, and so it is no surprise that on October 3rd, 2015, 26-year-old Chase Delwo and his brother, 30-year-old Shane, decided to head west to Bynum to bow hunt elk. Having been brought up on a family ranch in Blackleaf, the two brothers were experienced big game hunters who used bows as their preferred weapon. It was a chilled Saturday morning, and the clocks were striking eight. Being October, Choteau was immersed in intense cloud cover with temperatures going as low as seven. The vile wind was full of snow, with each exhalation leaving a condensed cloud of air. This limited their vision to as far as only five meters of their surroundings. But the thought of hot, sumptuous elk steak that the brothers would eat to the marrow of the last bone was enough motivation for them to face the harsh weather. Their limited visibility meant that hunting by stealth was going to be a huge challenge, and so the pair hatched a plan. They geared up and decided to split. 
Shane, the older brother, was going to scale up a ridge and wait while Chase was to drive the elk herd towards a creek bed. The ridge Shane had climbed provided a clear aerial view of the creek bed where he would size one of the elks before taking it down. They had devised the perfect plan, free of any flaws, or so they thought. As Chase was meandering the creek bed, the heavens suddenly opened and the rain started pouring. Just like a musical chime, it began as tapping as a drop hit his shoulders, but it soon developed to a rattling pitter-patter with more drops pouring. With the snow, misty air, and now rain, the weather was worsening with every step he took. He wondered if it would be a successful hunt given the shortcomings. Suddenly, a loud bugle followed by a chuckle at the end cut him short on his thoughts. He knew that sound, having gotten used to it during his many hunting escapades. It was a bull elk. Judging by the origin of the sound, the elk was nearby. Vainly, his fiend mind struggled to comprehend the direction of the source of the bugle. The creek was covered with rich soft grass that was beginning to get buried beneath the falling snow. To the north and east of him was the wonderful panorama of the rocky ridges and mountains partially covered in snow. And on one of those ridges was his brother patiently waiting to strike. Armed with his bow, Chase focused all his senses on finding the elk. Nothing in the world was going to stop him from completing this mission. Not even the droning music of running water from the nearby streams that were about to freeze because of the cold. But before he could go further, an eerie feeling that he was being watched stopped him in his tracks. Motionless, Chase sniffed the wind. The air here changed, it smelt different. A scent had come to his nostrils, one he had not smelt in a long time. It stirred him strangely. If only he had been able to see distinctly for just one mile, his eyes would have discovered it. He reared up three steps behind, as if trying to slowly rest his haunches and sit like a trained dog with his bow raised to level his face, ready to release the arrow. But before he could, the bear leaped, attacking him as if it had been waiting for this moment all its life. This sent him to the ground with a thud, the grizzly bear was huge. On its hind legs, it was taller than any human with its feet planted firmly on the wet, muddy ground. With its shaggy, thick brown fur, it seemed to bear the mysteries of nature with it. The bear then opened its huge mouth, grumbled and then sank its three-inch fangs into Chase's left eye and skull, completely catching him by surprise. As it is with nature, the hunter sometimes becomes the hunted. Having grown up on a family ranch, bear encounters were not alien to him, as he had been charged by lone bears not once or twice. However, even with this rich expansive background, he had been unable to avoid this nose-to-nose -nose encounter with a grizzly bear. If only the weather was a bit more welcoming, Chase would have seen the bear from afar and avoided it. For a moment, the bear stopped attacking. Chase was silent and immobile. Bleeding and seriously injured, he felt helpless. He knew that death was within and knocking. But the ordeal was far from over. The tenacious beast pinned him down with its clawed paws and once again let out a thundering roar as if announcing its dominance. It then took a step back, an opportunity that Chase used to sit up. But this turned out to be a mistake, as the bear came at him again, this time round, biting him on his leg and shaking him bitterly before throwing him up into the air. He came thudding down, but the bear was not done yet, as it went straight for his head. The picture of his beautiful wife Becca, back at home waiting for him, and his brother high up on the ridge crossed before Chase, and he knew that he had met his fate on this mushy creek with a splatter of soft mud and snow. It was during this short flashback that his memory came to his aid, as he remembered an article that his grandmother had once shown him on how animals, especially bears, have sensitive bad gag reflexes on their soft palates. 
With great courage, he mastered the little strength left in him and with all his might shoved his right arm into the bear's throat. Perplexed and confused, the bear disappeared into the snow while gagging uncomfortably. Chase knew that it wouldn't take long before the bear came back to finish him off, or even worse, he would bleed to death. He had to move. His camouflage hunting gear had been torn to tatters and he was covered in blood and mud. With his palms, he wiped the blood off his eyes. He chose flight over flight and dawdled through the creek bed's terrain towards the direction of the ridge he had seen his brother take. From the ridge, Shane saw his brother waving and thought that the cavalry was finally here. He positioned himself with his bow and arrow, ready to take the shot of his life. However, after taking a second look at his younger sibling, this time with more of a degree of acuity, Shane realized the dire state of his brother. He immediately dashed down to him and administered first aid. He stopped the bleeding but was worried about the possibility of internal bleeding and had to rush Chase to the hospital. He hurriedly carried Chase to the car, gunned the engine and pressed his foot hard on the gas pedal. The engine revved and the tires screeched as the rubber came to contact with the tarmac. Leaving a cloud of smoke behind, the air was filled with the smell of burnt diesel and rubber. Within seconds, the speed gauge was jerked a little over 100 miles per hour. The 20-minute drive felt like an eternity as Chase seemed to lose a decade with each breath. Luckily, there were only a few cars on the road, and within no time, they saw a big blue and white hospital sign. They were now at the emergency wing of the Beneficent Teton Medical Center in Choteau. Fortunately, they arrived just in time to save his life. After a five and a half hours long surgery, Chase's face was covered in hundreds of stitches. And when asked for his advice to anyone who wants to go hunting, he said that they should never go alone. And he is right, don't go hunting alone in rainy, misty weather. Try as much as possible to live in agreement with nature. After all, if you respect it, it will always reward you. If you don't, you may end up meeting your final affliction. Mark Jordan and Jacqueline Perry were celebrating their fourth wedding anniversary. Being outdoor enthusiasts, they both decided to mark the occasion with two weeks camping in Canada's Lake Missinibe Provincial Park. The 100,000 hectare park offers an incredible outdoor experience. Popular activities include canoeing, backpacking, boating, fishing, and camping. There are over 100 different campsites, many of which are only accessible by boat. When you set up your tent in Lake Missinibe Park, you really are on your own. Although this can be a magical experience, it can also prove deadly. Visitors are attracted to the area for its outstanding beauty. The large, peaceful lakes with their glassy surfaces reflecting the woodland surrounds. The haunting call of the loon and the nighttime howling of wolves. The majestic beauty of a moose standing knee-deep at the lake's edge or the glimpse of a black bear through the thick brush. It was September 2005, 80 kilometers north of Chapleau, Ontario. Mark and Jacqueline pulled up into a car park in Lake Missinibe Provincial Park. Together, they lifted their double kayak off the roof of their car and lowered it into the river. They loaded it up and climbed in. Both of them were enjoying the tranquility of the wilderness. They barely saw a soul for the first few days of their trip. They moored up at remote campsites. Often, the only indication it was a campsite was the presence of a thunder box. This was a three-sided cubicle placed over a hole in the ground which is used for a toilet. After pulling up at one campsite, the couple spent the remaining hours of sunlight organizing the tent, campfire, and dinner. They took a swim in the lake before settling down beside the blazing fire. The trip had been magical so far, a break that both of them had needed. The following morning, they awoke at the sun's first light. Stretching and yawning, Mark unzipped the tent and saw to the fire. He managed to reignite it from a few remaining embers. He collected some water from the lake to boil on the open flames, whilst Jacqueline foraged for wood to keep the fire going. 
they had a long paddle ahead of them until the next campsite, so decided to have a proper breakfast and fill their flasks with plenty of tea. As Jacqueline collected the wood in her arms, she heard a distinctive snap of a twig. She froze and looked around, but saw nothing. She called out to Mark, whose reply confirmed he was still by the fire. Not seeing anything, Jacqueline continued to collect wood amongst the trees. She took the armful back to the fire and then headed back for some more. Returning to the same spot, Jacqueline bent down to pick up more wood when suddenly she was knocked to the ground. The force was so strong and unexpected that she didn't have time to react. She let out a yell as she crashed onto the floor. Her head hit the ground and the air was knocked from her lungs. Jacqueline gasped as a black bear pinned her down and savagely mauled her face. She could feel the deep tearing from the bear's claws on her body, the pressure from the bear's jaws as it bit down on her face. She screamed. In an instant, Mark was there. He whipped his Swiss Army knife from his pocket and jumped onto the bear just as it tried to drag Jacqueline off into the woods. Mark held on. He wrapped his arms around the bear's neck and with the small blade of the pocket knife stabbed the bear again and again, but the bear thrashed around, managing to throw Mark off its back, sending him crashing to the ground. The attack was so sudden and so powerful, it had taken the couple completely by surprise. The size and weight of the bear was incredible. It hardly flinched when Mark drove his knife into its flesh. The bear was so focused on Jacqueline that it seemed nothing would stop it. It continued its frenzied attack on Jacqueline, grabbing her in its jaws once more. Mark leapt up and threw himself at the bear again. He punched it on the muzzle and pushed the knife into the bear's neck over and over. The bear let go of Jacqueline and ran off into the woods. Mark watched as he saw the hind end of the bear lumbering over fallen tree branches and vanishing. Mark held Jacqueline in his arms. She was bleeding heavily. He tried to stem the bleeding, but she had so many wounds it felt hopeless. He picked her up and carried her to their kayak. Lying her down in the bottom of the plastic boat, he began paddling frantically across the water. All the while, he was crying out for help. Jacqueline's cries died down. Her breathing became labored, and she closed her eyes. Mark told her not to give up. He yelled at her to stay awake. He desperately scanned the shoreline looking for anyone who could help. With each passing minute, he grew more and more desperate. Jacqueline was fading fast, but Mark continued to paddle the boat towards the next campsite in the hope of finding someone there. He himself had sustained significant injuries. The bear had severed several nerves in his arms and hands. He had puncture wounds from where it had bitten him as he fought with it, trying to save his wife. Blood oozed from deep gashes in his arms, trickling down his body as he pulled on each paddle stroke. After an agonizing hour had passed, Mark finally spotted two men in a paddle boat in the distance, a father and son from Pennsylvania. They heard Mark's desperate cries and paddled their boat over to the kayak. Holding the kayak steady against their boat, they carefully lifted Jacqueline onto theirs. Mark climbed aboard, and they all paddled together in search for help. They spotted a pontoon in the distance, with two people inside. Mark flagged them down. Remarkably, one was a doctor from North Carolina, and the other was an off-duty police officer. The doctor tried desperately to save Jacqueline. While the boat sped through the water, he stemmed the bleeding and began performing CPR. But it was too late. Help had arrived too late for Jacqueline. She succumbed to her injuries two hours after the attack, before they could get her to the park office six miles away. Mark was evacuated out of the wilderness and to Sudbury Regional Hospital. The deep lacerations he had sustained required surgery. He received 300 stitches and was pumped full of antibiotics to stave off infection. He slowly made a recovery in hospital. His injuries were fixed, but his heart was broken. His heroic efforts were rewarded with a medal of bravery, but Mark didn't feel brave. He felt like he could have done more. 
He wished he had known more about black bears and about their behavior. Bear experts who were asked to comment on the tragic events said that the bear wasn't just being aggressive, it was being predatory. It had sniffed out Jacqueline and Mark from a distance and homed in on their location. Seeing Jacqueline in the woodland on her own, the bear had stalked her. It had remained hidden and silent until the opportune moment when it struck. Mark had assumed when he was attacking the bear that punching it and stabbing it with a pocket knife would have been enough to cause it to run away. Instead, it continued to attack Jacqueline, causing fatal damage. Mark said that if he was able to hold on to the bear, grabbing it in a headlock and stabbing it with his knife, he should have slit its throat, killing it before it could inflict any more damage. Following the attack, officials immediately closed off the interior section of the park where the attack had taken place. They searched for campers in the area to warn, but because visitors were under no obligation to register their presence, it was not known how many visitors there were in the area. Black bear attacks were few and far between in the Ontario region. Since 1978, there had only been four known fatalities caused by black bears. The black bear involved in Jacqueline's attack was eventually hunted down by officials. They tracked down and killed a wounded black bear that was still in the area. It was a young, thin, and a hungry male who had been preying on the couple. It had taken the opportunity to secure an easy meal when Mark and Jacqueline visited the area. Black bears are especially dangerous when malnourished, sometimes causing them to attack people out of desperation for a meal. Jacqueline had simply been in the wrong place at the wrong time. She hadn't startled the bear. She hadn't intruded on a female with her cubs. She had just been collecting wood for the fire whilst the male bear stalked her. There was nothing she could have done once the bear started to maul her. All she could do was wait for her unfortunate final affliction. On the morning of June 5th, 2022, 43-year-old Mukesh Rai and his wife, 39-year-old Gudia Rai, had gone to pray at the Kermai Temple in the central Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. The area is known for its varied topography, including river valleys, small peaks, and dense forests. More than a third of this large Indian state is covered in trees and is populated by a wide range of flora and fauna not found anywhere else across the country. The forests are home to animals like the porcupine, fox, wild boars, bison, and the infamous Indian sloth bear. The sloth bear is one of eight species of bears and is a native of the Indian subcontinent. The animal is a vicious predator, weighing close to an American black bear at around 300 pounds and measuring over six feet in length. It is distinguished by its disproportionately large claws relative to its body size. These claws can be more than five inches long and are a natural adaptation to dig up termite mounds and insects. They are also a formidable weapon in case of an attack, helping the bear rip through skin and open up its prey's body with one deep scratch. A disturbing fact about the sloth bear is that it is known to be the most aggressive to humans among bears around the world. They see humans as not much more than a frail and slow prey that can make for an easy meal. On that fateful early morning at 6 a.m., Mukesh and Gudia decided to go on a stroll a few kilometers outside their house and visit the Kermai temple nearby to pray. The place was several minutes away by foot and the couple thought this was a good time to catch up with a romantic walk on their way to the temple. However, the path they intended to take went through the thick forests of the Pana National Park and they were blissfully unaware of the danger of walking through it alone in the early hours of the day. Sloth bears are nocturnal animals that hide and sleep in the jungle for most of the day, but it was still regarded unsafe to tread amongst the trees at the crack of dawn when the bears were likely still awake. At 6.30, Mukesh and Gudia made their way back from the temple. The area was mostly empty and the town had not yet woken up. Bears were the last thing on their mind as they took their first steps towards their house. The couple walked among the forest, making their way through the branches and fallen trees. The place was eerily silent, unusual for the bustling and busy central Indian city. 
They were only about half a mile from their house when they heard some commotion among the leaves. Mukesh looked around but dismissed the sound as a farmer or gardener working at the park. Then, as they were less than two kilometers from home, Mukesh heard a terrifying growl from his left. He looked and saw a large mass of black fur jump at his wife, Gudia. The scene turned from a calm ambience into a nightmare within seconds as his wife screamed and pleaded for help. The bear had lunged at her out of nowhere, taking aim for her neck and plunging its sharp claws deep into her neck. She was overcome with the massive weight of the bear and collapsed to the ground. Blood sprayed out of her neck as Mukesh screamed at the top of his lungs trying to scare the animal away. The bear displayed an eerie behavior unlike a hungry predator would, almost acting possessed and malevolent. It tried to scratch at Gudia's torso and face, inflicting as much pain as it possibly could. Mukesh was frozen in fear for a short few seconds, watching his wife being devoured by a vicious forest predator. Gudia was being mauled and eaten alive, with the bear growling at her with every piece of flesh it bit off. Mukesh looked around for large rocks and managed to throw them at the bear from a distance, but the bear refused to let go, as bite marks and claw scratches started to fill Gudia's body. She lay there on the forest floor in a pool of blood, losing consciousness fast. Mukesh cried and called for help, but it seemed as though there was no one hearing his screams. He realized no help was coming, and it was down to him to save his wife's life. He jumped at the bear from behind, trying to tackle and punch it. The bear was momentarily thrown off, stepping away a few feet. Mukesh saw the opportunity to drag his wife to safety and pulled her blood-sodden body by the hand away from the bear. But the respite was short-lived. The animal ran toward him and jumped at him in a similar fashion as it did with Gudia. It immediately went for the neck, trying to end his life as swiftly as possible. Its razor-sharp claws plunged deep into Mukesh's soft neck, damaging his spine and nerves and paralyzing him. Their fate had now been sealed, as Gudia had lost consciousness and Mukesh lay paralyzed and helpless, bleeding away as the bear circled their dying bodies in a cynical fashion. Villagers nearby had heard the commotion by this time and reached the spot where the screams were coming from. What they witnessed at the spot was a gruesome sight. The bear guarded the couple's bodies, refusing to let go. It had dragged them to a pool of water a few feet away and nibbled and chewed at their bodies, taking out chunks of flesh bit by bit. The villagers tried to scare away the bear, throwing rocks at it in hopes that it would run away so something from their dead bodies could be salvaged. But the animal did not budge, and gunmen had to be called onto the scene to shoot the bear dead. The bear displayed erratic behavior, pulling their arms and smelling their bodies while showing frantic and jittery body movements. The bystanders and authorities tried to scare the bear away without having to kill it so they could study its odd behavior. After five hours of the terrifying ordeal, the animal was finally tranquilized and transported to a nearby vet research center for analysis. It was later found that the bear was in the final stage of rabies and had launched the attack out of confusion and irritation. It was in pain from the infection and likely did not kill the couple to eat them. After only a few hours in captivity, the bear died from rabies. But the news spread to the park rangers who were ordered to close the park immediately and call back anyone working there. Fear of the infection spreading took over the town, and hundreds more animals had to be tested to make sure nothing else had contracted rabies. Authorities claimed that increasing deforestation had forced the bears to come closer and closer to human settlements in search of food. The central Indian state records some of the highest instances of bear attacks around the world due to the proximity of bear and human populations and the lack of proper regulation and safety measures. The attack was also attributed to the time of the year, as June was the month of the Mahoa tree flowering, where bears would come to feed on the trees and humans would try and harvest them for profit. It was a chain of unfortunate events that brought the sloth bear and the couple dangerously close, compounded by the disease the animal was suffering from. The news of the death spread across the country and the gory nature of the attack added to the fear of bears and human populations that lived nearby. More than 50 sloth bear attacks had been recorded in the state consistently for six years since 2015, with several people in the area showing damaged limbs, scratches, and bite marks. 
The Indian government gave the family of the couple 400,000 Indian rupees in compensation, equivalent to around 5,000 US dollars. But the news of the death devastated friends and family of the deceased. Their bodies could not be identified until later the next day, as their faces and bodies had been mauled beyond recognition. For Mukesh and Gudia, a casual morning stroll turned into a harrowing ordeal within a few minutes as they died trying to save each other while being torn apart by a formidable forest predator, bringing them both to their terrifying final affliction. As the sun rose over the pristine landscape of Senarajik Nunavut, Elijah Kurnark and his companion set out on what they thought would be an uneventful journey to his cabin. The warm August air held the promise of a relaxing weekend filled with laughter and good company. Unfortunately, fate had other plans. Elijah revved up his ATV and took off down the trail. His partner and sister-in-law were close behind, their engines roaring in unison. As they drove deeper into the wilderness, the beauty of the landscape enveloped them. The towering trees and snow-capped mountains were a sight to behold. But their peaceful ride was about to take a dangerous turn. It was just 15 to 20 minutes into their trip when they saw her, a local woman waving frantically to get their attention. Elijah pulled over and turned off his engine, wondering what was going on. The woman approached him, her eyes wide with fear. She told Elijah there was a polar bear near his cabin and that it was not safe there. Elijah shrugged off her warning, dismissing it as an overreaction. The three continued down the path, riding their ATVs through the snowy terrain. When they finally reached the cabin, Elijah's partner and sister-in-law decided to stay inside and rest. But Elijah was too curious to sit still. He wanted to sneak a glimpse of the said polar bear. Elijah wandered through the trees, and he couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. Suddenly, he caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of his eye. His heart racing, he slowly turned his head to see a giant polar bear just a few yards away, tearing apart a carcass with its powerful jaws. For a moment, Elijah was frozen in place, unsure what to do. His heart pounded in his chest as he stared down at the massive polar bear. The creature had detected his presence and was now growling menacingly, its eyes fixed on him. Suddenly, the bear stood up on its hind legs and abandoned its food to come after Elijah. Elijah turned and sprinted as fast as he could, but he was no match for the speed and strength of an angry polar bear. The bear's powerful strides closed the gap between them in a matter of seconds, and before Elijah could react, the bear tackled him to the ground. Elijah's world went black as the polar bear's massive jaws closed around his back. He could feel the bear's sharp teeth tearing through his flesh, ripping muscle and tendons apart. He screamed out in agony, his voice echoing through the quiet forest. But the bear wasn't finished yet. It began to maul him, thrashing him from side to side like a rag doll. As Elijah's life hung in the balance, his sister and sister-in-law heard the commotion from inside the cabin. Terrified, they rushed outside, their eyes widening in horror at the sight before them. The polar bear was attacking Elijah, and he was defenseless. Sensing the new presence in the area, the polar bear turned its attention to Elijah's partner. Without a second thought, Elijah struggled to his feet, determined to protect her from harm he began to chase after the bear. But the bear was quick and it sensed Elijah's presence. In an instant, it turned around and charged toward him, its massive paws pounding the ground as it closed in on him. Elijah could feel his heart racing in his chest as he tried to outrun the bear, but it was too fast. As they ran around the ATV, the bear caught Elijah again, its powerful jaws closing around his arm, neck, and face. Elijah cried out in pain, struggling to free himself from the bear's grip. But it was no use. The bear was too strong. The bear started pulling at Elijah's hair, inflicting excruciating pain as it began tearing his scalp away. 
His partner and sister-in-law were horrified at the sight, so they tried throwing things at the creature in hopes it would run away. Suddenly, the bear turned its attention toward them. The massive polar bear lunged at one of the women, its jaws snapping dangerously close to her face. Elijah began blacking out, but with a surge of adrenaline, he struggled to his feet, determined to do whatever it took to distract the bear. After all, the women had children and grandchildren, Elijah thought. He yelled and waved his arms, trying to capture the bear's attention. It worked. The bear turned to him again and began attacking him. However, this time, the creature opened its menacing jaws and bit Elijah on the neck. He had never experienced pain like that in his life as he felt the bear's tooth inside his eyes. Elijah's world turned dark. But just as he thought all was lost, shots rang out from an unknown source. The bear stumbled back, roaring in pain and confusion as Elijah lay there, struggling to stay conscious. Afterward, Elijah couldn't hear anything anymore. He was worried that the bear might have killed the other two, but he couldn't get up. His body was battered and bruised, his arm torn apart by the bear's ferocious attack. Suddenly, a voice called out to them. It was the local reverend's wife. I'm all right, Elijah said, his voice barely above a whisper. And then, to his relief, he heard his partner's voice calling out to him from nearby. His sister-in-law was alive, too. Elijah felt relief washing over him. Eventually, the three were airlifted to a hospital. Elijah was taken to a hospital in Ottawa while the two women remained in Iqaluit for treatment. In later investigations, police found the bear dead near the cabins and learned the bear was shot and killed by locals. As he lay in the hospital bed, Elijah reflected on the events. The memory of the polar bear's massive jaws and razor-sharp claws still haunted him, a reminder of the danger lurking in the wilderness. Elijah learned that polar bears were beautiful and majestic creatures, but they were also powerful and dangerous. He now knew to respect their strength and be cautious when venturing into their territory. Thankfully, Elijah eventually made a full recovery and lives on to tell the horrifying story of when he was attacked by a polar bear. It was late August 2011. The warm weather was a welcoming sight, a luxury in the case of living in eastern Siberia. It was a great sign to start fulfilling their outdoor plans. Olga and Igor had been planning this trip for a while now, and the sun appeared at just the right time. The two prepared their bags, fishing lines, rods, and whatnot for the camping trip. Tatiana, who was not outdoorsy, was left in the house while the two bonded over their shared interest. Knowing her 19-year-old daughter would be accompanied by her husband, Tatiana was quite confident in letting her leave for this trip. However, a certain sinking feeling loomed over her, and she couldn't explain it. No matter, it must simply be a mother's paranoia, she thought. Olga was growing up fast and had just turned 19 that year. A few days ago, she had just earned her driver's license and finished music school. Tatiana reminisced about the time when Olga was little and knew nothing about the world. Now she was turning into a proper adult. Although Olga exuded a lot of energy and would joke around all the time, you should not let that fool you. Beyond her happy-go-lucky demeanor lay a deep pool of compassion, empathy, and remarkable intellect, enough for her to pursue a career in psychology. She recently signed up to be trained as a psychologist, and Olga couldn't stop talking about it at home. Igor strapped the equipment they needed on the car's roof. Afterward, he began warming up the vehicle. While sitting in shotgun, Olga looked at Tatiana one last time and waved goodbye. Tatiana waved back to her and Igor, not knowing it would be the last time she'd see her husband and daughter alive. As the vehicle backed out of the driveway, Tatiana felt a sense of deep loneliness. However, it was just a camping trip, Tatiana reassured herself. Driving up the highway, Olga and Igor headed towards the Paratunka River, eastern Siberia. Getting to Paratunka district was easy, even though it was 70 kilometers away from Petropavlovsk. This was thanks to the direct road from the capital of the region. The thick vegetation surrounding the Paratunka River was a feast for the eyes, beautiful and lush. However, it was foreboding something ominous. 
According to locals, the grass surrounding the area could grow up to two meters, effectively hiding anything within it, even deadly predators. This was especially dangerous for Olga and Igor since they were in Russia, the country with the largest bear population in the world. Home to at least four species of brown bears, Russia's national animal is the bear. However, as ferocious as these creatures are, they rarely attack humans. They regard them as a fellow predator and deliberately avoid them. Unfortunately, today, that was not the case. Reaching Paratunka district, Igor parked the car. He began unloading the equipment, enlisting the help of Olga to carry the materials needed for fishing. The two made their way towards the Paratunka River. Arriving at the site, the two gazed at the beautiful rocky scenery. Small bushes of lush vegetation glistening green under the sun peppered the riverside. Various trees grew at different sizes and shapes from a distance, highlighting the immense snow-capped beauty of the mountains and volcanoes in the background. It was nature at its finest, a stark contrast to the plain, simplistic, straightforward aesthetic of the city. It was a cool, dry day to fish. While the two set up camp, they talked about life and Olga's plans to become a psychologist. As a youngster thrown suddenly into the world of adulthood, Olga was both wary and excited about the future of her chosen career path. However, her outgoing, extroverted personality was ready to take on new challenges. The two fished for quite some time and got what they needed. They sat by the river for hours, waiting for movement from their fishing rods while gazing at the immaculate beauty of the Paratunka wilderness. After gathering what they needed, it was time to head home. The two began packing away their equipment and things. With everything in place, they began their way home. However, Igor suddenly realized he had left something at the site, so the two decided to return and get it. That was when Igor, Olga, and Tatiana's lives began to unravel. A study in 2019 indicated that the number of bear attacks had increased steadily between 2000 and 2015. This was mainly due to habitat destruction, displacing the bears and moving them closer to populated areas. The prolonged exposure of bears to humans makes them less afraid of people. The study indicates that 47% of these attacks are caused by humans accidentally encountering female bears with their cubs. This is what happened to Olga and Igor. As the two made their way back into the site, a large brown silhouette emerged from the trees. It was a brown bear with three cubs in tow. The direness of the situation went from none to extreme. Ahead of Olga on the trail, Igor sensed the danger and immediately began making noise to scare the bears away. The female bear stood on its hind legs, cocked its head back and forth, and let loose a deafening growl. There was nowhere to run. Dropping on its front paws, the bear charged towards Igor. Running at almost 50 kilometers per hour, the 600 pounds of ferocious muscle struck Igor like a freight train, knocking him to the ground. His screams filled the quiet atmosphere. Meanwhile, Olga watched in horror as the bear mercilessly attacked her stepfather. Igor was powerless underneath the brown bear. With all its weight, it stood up on its hind legs and landed its front paws on Igor's face. And the screams were no more. Breaking his neck and crushing his skull, Igor was dead. Olga screamed in terror as she ran away for her life. The bear shifted its amber-brown eyes on Olga like she had a target on her back. In just a few seconds, the 70 yards Olga managed to cover away from the bear disappeared. The female bear had reached her and grabbed her leg. Knocking her to the ground, Olga did the only thing she could think of in that situation. She called the person closest to her, Tatiana. Without a clue about what was happening, Tatiana received the disturbing call. Initially, she thought it was a joke, knowing this was right up Olga's alley of antics. However, after hearing the bear growling in the background, Tatiana's worst fear made itself known to her. She dialed Igor's phone, thinking he could help Olga in the situation. However, the phone rang eerily in the quiet of the forest, with no one to attend to it. Olga's muffled screams echoed in the background. Due to the struggle, the phone calls kept cutting off, but Olga was able to give her mother an account of what was happening. Mom, the bear is eating me. Mom, it's such agony. Mom, help. Olga screamed as the bear and its three cubs chewed on her body. Meanwhile, Tatiana alerted the police and relatives in Termalny. An hour after the attack, Olga mustered enough strength to bid her mother the last goodbye. 
Mom, it's not hurting anymore. I don't feel the pain. Forgive me for everything. I love you so much. The phone lost connection. Tatiana felt a searing pain in her chest and could not believe what was happening. 30 minutes had passed since Tatiana alerted them. Igor's brother, Andre, had arrived at the site accompanied by local police. Past the thick vegetation, Andre could hear something ominous. The police proceeded to get closer to the source of the sound. Andre was sweating up a storm. They were met with a gruesome scene. The bear was still devouring Igor's body. 70 yards away from them, Olga lay lifeless on the grass. Her face, chest, and neck were so badly mangled, she was unrecognizable. Six hunters were sent in to shoot the bear and her three cubs. Andre called Tatiana to tell her the terrible news. The unfortunate case of Igor and Olga gained much public attention, even appearing in international news articles. My daughter was such fun. She was so cheerful, friendly, and warm, a weeping Tatiana said in a later interview. Although bear attacks have gone up, fatal incidents are still very rare. However, this doesn't make Olga and Igor's death any less painful for Tatiana. To be on the phone with your daughter as she is being eaten alive by a man-eating grizzly bear has got to be one of the most traumatizing things to go through as a parent. May Olga Moskalova and her stepfather Igor Siganenkov rest in peace. On June 21st, 2021, 16-year-old Mikhail Garin was helping travelers explore the Ergaki National Park as a tour guide in the Cyan Mountains of Siberia. The area is a picturesque tourist resort with rocky mountains and high waterfalls. The summer is the only time of the year that the province is easily accessible for tourists to explore. Animals like the snow leopard, moose, wild boar, and wolves are some of the largest populations that inhabit this rough geography. But the most formidable of these predators is the infamous Russian grizzly bear. It is the largest bear species on the continent at over 2.5 meters in length and standing more than three meters tall on its hind legs. Armed with a set of 42 teeth, including molars and razor sharp front canines, it can tear through its victim's flesh and deliver crushing force to the bone in a single bite. Thousands of fatal bear attacks have been recorded in the last few decades, and most of them have resulted from humans venturing too close into bear territory. On that fateful day, early in the morning, young Mikhail was making preparations for visits and exploration trips around the park for the group of travelers that had hired him as a helper and tour guide. He realized he was short on some important supplies for the camp and decided to make a quick trip to a nearby village downhill. It was seven in the morning, and the sun had barely started to shine through the dense fog and clouds. The path to the village went through a forest cover that remained frozen for most of the year. The young boy picked up his backpack and set a foot downhill to the village, hoping to make it back in time. The cold morning fog had silenced the crunch of the leaves that littered the forest floor. He had seldom been up so early and had just started his new job as a tour guide at the park. Mikhail walked among the tall forest trees with only the occasional chirping bird that disturbed the dead silence. After just a few minutes of walking, he heard a muffled grunt in the distance that perked up his ears. He was aware of the danger of animal attacks in the area, but had never encountered one. The boy looked back trying to pierce through the morning fog to see into the distance, but there was nothing there. He quickened his pace and walked straight ahead, and he dismissed anything he heard as the odd deer or elk that would sometimes graze the forest. He then heard the grunt again, this time much closer behind him. It was followed by the sound of footsteps approaching the distance. The little boy glanced back, and what he saw froze him still in terror. A giant mass of brown fur peeked at him from among the woods. The feared grizzly bear stood less than ten feet away from the frail young boy, with its eyes locked straight on him. Mikhail stood there, unsure of the next move to make. He had studied wildlife brochures about the area and knew that running was the greatest mistake he could make in that moment. There was no one to call out to for help, 
It was just the massive bear and the little boy, surrounded by miles of forest on every side. Mikhail's heartbeat raced as every step back he took was matched by a step forward of the bear. In desperation, he looked up at the trees in hopes of climbing into safety, but the branches provided no support to pull himself up. The bear realized how vulnerable the boy was and lunged straight at him with all its might. Grizzly bears can stand on their two hind legs and like to swiftly kill their victims with a massive stomp on the neck to immobilize its prey before feasting on it. The bear leapt at Mikhail from the distance, pinning him beneath its legs. The little boy screamed in pain with the massive weight of the bear atop his fragile body. The predator growled at him and took aim for the neck, plunging its front canines deep into his flesh. Mikhail could offer no resistance and breathed his last in just a few short minutes. The animal dragged him deep into the woods and cut open his torso to devour his insides. Several hours had passed and the tourists back at the camp were left wondering where the young boy had gone. Despite searching and calling out his name, Mikhail was nowhere to be found. The camp settlement was close to the opening of the forest, and they ventured into it trying to find him. Just a few minutes later, they discovered something that confirmed the brutal tragedy that had taken place. It was the half-eaten corpse of the young boy, identified by his shirt, lying beside the trees in the distance. Horrified at the gruesome nature of his death, they stumbled forward trying to assess what had actually happened. It was only a few moments later that they noticed the grizzly bear among the woods guarding its kill. The tourists now found themselves in the same predicament as the young boy, but didn't know what to do. In desperation, one of the tourists ran back to his camp, prompting the bear to chase after him. But the man was armed with a small pocket knife, which he used to take several jabs at the animal's neck as it leapt onto him. The small knife was no match for the sheer size of the bear and was only enough to momentarily throw it off. The animal walked away and sat down near Mikhail's half-eaten body, giving the tourists just enough time to escape and run back to their camp. The men went and alerted authorities at the Ergaki National Park, detailing the death of their tour guide and their harrowing ordeal they just went through. Several park rangers and sharpshooters spread into the forest in an attempt to locate and tranquilize the man-eating bear. The park was immediately closed, and everyone working was called back to safety. By the time the men made it to the site where they found Mikhail's body, they found the bear still lying beside him on the forest floor. The park rangers, assuming that the bear was dead from the knife wounds, approached the animal to carry it away. But as the rangers went close enough to reach, it got up and lunged at the men. Fortunately, the ranger was armed with a rifle, loaded and aimed at the bear, and fired several shots as it jumped at him. The bear was finally dead, with over seven bullets to the head and chest. The tourists looked at the body of the young boy, which resembled a mauled carcass, and realized how lucky they were to have escaped the attack with just a few cuts and bruises. The attack was the result of a series of coincidences that ended in the brutal demise of the young boy. The prolonged freezing winters had forced the grizzly bears to descend and populate the forests closer to human settlements in search of food. That eventually led to crossing paths with humans more often, resulting in an erosion of fear and greater proclivity to see humans as prey. Climate change had also been depleting their natural diet and disturbing the natural food chain of their habitat. On that fateful day, the final nail in the coffin for Mikhail was his decision to take a shortcut to the village through the forest instead of the path circumventing the forest carved out by the park authorities. The news spread like wildfire and prompted action to retreat human settlements further away from bear territory in order to avoid another fatal attack. But 16-year-old Mikhail wasn't so lucky, and his half-eaten and almost unrecognizable body was scooped up and buried at a graveyard nearby. His family was left devastated at the loss of their son, who had gone out to earn a livelihood 
and support them at such a young age, but tragically instead met his untimely final affliction.